Welcome to another episode of James Explains. We're again taking a look at one of Matt Parker's maths puzzles. In this video, we will explore triangular peg solitaire and the end states for any size board, starting at the beginning with size 0. Continuing on to size 1. Size 2 is at least a little more interesting, but as it's not big enough to allow any of the pegs to jump, let's continue on to size 3. Size 3 isn't immediately obviously possible, but if we first take a look at the starting position of a missing peg on the side, you'll notice that there are no possible first moves. If instead we start with a missing peg on a corner, you can see there is only one possible unique move at any stage, finally resulting in this arrangement where it cannot be completed. Size 4 is the board size used for the puzzle section of Matt Parker's Maths Puzzle, so hopefully there should be a winning solution for this size. To start off with, we will look at all possible starting arrangements. Firstly, we can start with the very centre piece missing. We can also start with an edge piece missing, and using reflection and rotation, we can see that this is only one unique arrangement. Finally, we could start at one of the corners, and again, this is also only a single unique arrangement. So let's try the centre piece missing first. To look at whether or not this is possible, let's look at how pieces can move. Because we require three positions in a row to be able to jump a piece, we can see that the individual jumps can all fall into groups of three different directions. A puzzle of this size has three of these groups, and as you can see, none of the possible moves can end on the centre piece. Therefore, starting with a missing piece in the centre does not allow for any possible first moves. So, with starting in the centre out, let's look at starting on a corner. This allows two first moves, but again, because of reflection, this is only one unique move. So, if we make that first move, we are left with this arrangement as our second position. We can start tracking our moves to see what possible game combinations are available. From this second position, there is again only one possible move, so that gives us only a single third position that is possible. Finally, we have more than one unique move, as there are two possible jumps to make in this position. We can represent this by branching our path to show possible options we have found. The first of these branches then has three possible unique moves to follow, and the other branch has only one possible move, but it is one of the three arrangements we have already discovered. All three of these arrangements can lead to one following arrangement, but one of them is also able to lead to a second. Both of these arrangements then only have one possible arrangement to reach. As you can see from this final arrangement, no further moves are possible, so out of our three possible starting positions, we only have one remaining. Let's again look at the branching path from this arrangement. This has two possible first moves, which branch into four possible arrangements, then eight, and so on and so on, until we exhaust all possible paths and are left with only one possible arrangement for the winning solution. As we're only looking for winning approaches, we can ignore a large proportion of this network, and we're left with a smaller network of possible paths to reach our winning solution. Before the puzzle, we don't want just any solution, we're looking for the one with the least possible moves. To find this, we want to identify sections of our path where the same piece is moved across multiple stages. We then take the path that connects up these multi-stage moves, and we're left with our winning solution requiring only 5 moves to solve. One thing we can see, is that starting at an edge piece will end at its corresponding edge piece on its adjacent edge. Through reflection and rotation, this gives us six possible starting and ending arrangements for a puzzle of this size. But what does it look like when we go one size larger? For this size 5 puzzle, we could choose to start at one of the corner pieces. From this corner, we can finish in the same position, the centre of the opposite edge, or at the second last position on either of the adjacent edges. These are also the same possible ending positions if we start on either of these adjacent edge locations, or the opposite edge. However, the opposite edge can also finish at its opposite centre position too. The only remaining starting positions are in the centre, and from starting here, the only possible place we can finish is at the centre of the opposite edge. To represent this in a different way, let's give each of our nodes its own index, starting at zero of course. We can arrange these nodes and then show the possible finishing locations from any given starting location, where any node within the blue boundary 
is also able to finish back at its starting location. Here is what all 15 possible arrangements look like. But what if we want to start going larger than this? For size 6, we begin to see a more regular pattern as we are less constrained by the small size of the board. To see this pattern, we will overlay a triangular grid over the board. If we then take any of the positions that fall on the intersection of the grid, then from any of these starting places, we are able to finish at any of the locations on the grid. We can translate the grid into a position to include any of the nodes, and this holds true for any of the other selections on this grid. Moving up to size 7, we again use the same grid, however the arrangements behave differently in this circumstance. You can see that we can translate this board into three different groups of nodes on the intersections. What is interesting about this size is that starting in any position in the left group can finish at any position in the right group and only in those positions. The same goes for any starting position in the right group being able to finish at any position in the left group and only those positions. The lower group however, no matter what position you start from in this group of nodes, it will not be possible to win the game. What sets this group apart from others is that this group includes all three corners of the board in its selection. This pattern then continues for all boards beyond this size. We can say that for any board where the number of rows mod 3 is not 1, that a game may finish on any place on the same grid that it started on and no other place. For boards with a number of rows mod 3 equal to 1, there are two possible cases. Firstly, if the starting position is on a grid that includes the corners, the game cannot be won. Alternatively, if the starting position is on one of the two grids that exclude the corners, it may finish on any place on its opposing grid and no other place. If you would like to see the original puzzle, or others like it, visit thinkmaths.co.uk slash mathspuzzles. Finally, I would like to say that the solutions for the boards of any given size in this video is not based on an absolute proof, but merely a large population of simulated games, so I can't guarantee that it will hold up for all possible numbers. Having said that, if you'd like to see a video on any topic in particular, let me know down in the comments. And as always, thanks for watching.